The following program is made possible by the partners and friends of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. You were created to be more than you are now, to love more than you love now, and to live a life that's fully alive. Take a few minutes and join Pastor Ronnie Phillips for a message of grace that will help you live fully alive. Come back. A return to an activity you've formerly been successful in. It takes training, hard work, and dedication. But with some effort, you can not only regain, but surpass what you used to have. After a tough year like we've all been through, aren't you ready for a comeback? Join Pastor Ronnie Phillips in Chattanooga for the Comeback Conference, September 19th through the 22nd at Abba's House. We're going to empower leaders and equip pastors to make a comeback and be all that God has created you to be. Hear from Bishop Dale Bronner, Dr. Ron Phillips, Dr. Ronnie Phillips Jr. and others. Register at RonniePhillips.org and make a comeback this year. Greetings partners and friends, it's Pastor Ronnie Phillips, lead pastor here at Ibis House in Chattanooga, Tennessee and founder of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. Hope you'll connect with our ministry. We're all over the place. You'll have to go to my website, RonniePhillips.org, and you can see where we're on television and how you can watch us each and every week. Thank you for watching today. Today I'm going to bring you a message about generational curses and the generational sin struggle. You know, it's not an accident you struggle with what you struggle with. It's not an accident that you look the way you look or you respond the way you respond. There are things passed down to you through the Spirit and through your DNA, and some of those things have to be recognized and broken off of your life so that you can rebuild your life or rewrite your destiny for the generations to come. This message is profound. I really believe there is revelation in it for you but you have to bring the spirit and your intellect to this to see the patterns that the enemy tries to use to keep us doing the same things over and over in our lives. I believe God wants to break the power of sin off your life so that you can live free and fully alive. I want to tell you how. Watch right now. The Lord uh, really has been dealing with me about this particular message. It's a warfare message, and we can't release the blessing until we deal with the generational sin struggle. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the generational sin struggle. One of the phrases that I've been quoted as saying during the midst of a pandemic and all the racial issues that have been rising up in our country was that we don't have a skin issue, we have a sin issue. And I still believe that. And I still believe that Satan's way is to match evil for evil. There's nothing wrong with the peaceful protest. There's nothing wrong for standing up for what you believe, for your family, for your people, for your community. But when you match evil for evil, friend, and you start burning and hurting your own people, to prove a point, you are now under the spell of Satan and you need deliverance. I've been praying that God would bring our nation together, our church together. I'm seeing it in churches. Pastors are coming together, they're praying together again, they're communicating again, but we need revival in this nation. We have a sin problem. It didn't start with you, it started with Adam in the Garden of Eden. We have a sin problem in our church and in our nation. There's a song in country music. I actually like it because it makes me laugh, but it's a song full of debauchery. It's called, I Come From a Long Line of Losers. And it's a hilarious song and it makes me laugh, but if you really track our ancestry back to the Garden of Eden, we do. We come from a long line of sinners, but Jesus bored that curse on the cross so that we could live free and fully alive. And we don't have to live under the curse of sin any longer. 
We don't have to live under the curse of what was said about us, what was spoken over us, what daddy did, what granddaddy did, what great granddaddy did. At some point, that has to be broken and we have to embrace our new lives in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Jeremiah is a book of warning and Lamentations is a book of mourning. Oftentimes, God sends prophets to warn us about our conditions in our nations, in our souls. He sends a warning, but when we don't heed the warning, then comes mourning. What we are mourning about today is what wasn't taken care of yesterday. What we are dealing with today is because our ancestors didn't deal with it in years past. If you are going to be a difference maker in the kingdom of God, and if you're going to change your world and your family, you have to be a pioneer. Everybody has to be a pioneer. You can decide to keep the same sin trajectory going with you and your family, or you can break it, and you can speak a better word. You can speak a blessing. You can change your world, and when you change your heart and your world, this world will change. Everybody's waiting on somebody else to do something, somebody else to fix it. It starts with us. Jeremiah had thought God had abandoned the people of Israel in Lamentations. They are in mourning. They call themselves orphans. They call themselves poverty-stricken people. The Assyrians had tricked them into signing a deal that would assure their peace, but it didn't happen. And they are mourning the loss of their land that had been given to the tribes. They've lost everything because what we mourn about today is what wasn't handled properly yesterday by our fathers and grandfathers. If they didn't fix it, it's our job to fix it. If they didn't speak it, it's our job to speak it. And we must move in the direction of unity. And not only that, you can break the generational sin curse off your life, and I wanna teach you how to do that today before we get out of here. But first, I wanna to talk to you about what it looks like to live under a curse, under a generational curse. What is a generational curse? It's an orphan spirit that's never been dealt with and an addiction or a struggle or some kind of sin that is passed on from generation to generation and it keeps recycling itself and you keep going through the same addictive behaviors and you keep dealing with the same stuff. And you fail to break that curse and be the person God created you to be. The person God formed in your mother's womb. The purpose that God has predestined for you. Out of fear, insecurity, an orphan spirit, a curse, whatever it may be, we choose not to pursue God, not to seek first his kingdom because we are living under a curse. Children and adults who are under a curse exhibit many behaviors. Without the Father's blessing on someone's life, they can go one of many directions. The first kind of person that people are under a curse can become are seekers. Everybody say seekers. Seekers are people who are always searching for intimacy, always searching for affirmation, always searching for acceptance, but seldom are able to tolerate it. They want to be loved and affirmed, but when you try to love them, it's like hugging a porcupine. When you try to show them acceptance, they push you away because they're under a curse. Things were said about them. Things have been passed down to them. So they constantly seek affirmation, but no matter how much of it they get, it's never enough because there's a hole on the inside of them that can only be filled by Jesus. Seekers, these kinds of people love the courtship but hate the marriage. They love to date, but they hate covenant. They can't commit to anything. They can't finish anything. These kinds of people are often very intimate prior to marriage, but they shut it down after marriage because they've achieved the desired result. 
and they become cold because they haven't received the blessing from above. Seekers, number two, shattered. Everybody say shattered. These are folks who are plagued with fear, anxiety, and depression, all demonic spirits. They are withdrawn, they're isolated, at times suicidal, because yes, others seek to fill the void. These folks just live in a shattered state, a broken state. They are brokenhearted, and although the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, they never allow the Lord or anybody in because they're broken. They need to be put back together. They need to be forgiven. They need to forgive those that have hurt them. Shattered people. Then there are the smothers. The smothers. These are the people, they're like a 2,000 pound sponge. And in order to fill that void in their lives, they suck the ever loving life out of everybody and everything they are connected with. It could be a friend, it could be a church congregation, it could be a business. People are drawn to them, but they take, 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 take to fill that void and they never give anything back. They are so emotionally empty that when a person who genuinely loves them tries to just get some space, they lash out. The smothers. So scared of losing a relationship, you smother the one God gave you. So scared of losing what little affirmation you have, you smother it to death. And it causes people to push away. Next, you have the angry. The angry, that's what we're seeing in our nation. Evil for evil, anger for anger, hatred for hatred. Where in the Bible is that? Somebody's got to act like a Christian. And somebody's got to stand up for righteousness, justice, and truth. Angry. As long as people are angry with each other, they stay chained to one another. That's why we don't forgive. That's why we say things we don't mean. Because we think we want our independence but we choose anger to stay connected with the person that hurt us. Anger, rage, bitterness, malice, all sins according to the word of God. But we choose to stay in that state because we are comfortable there because that's how we were raised. That's how daddy and mama were, grandmama, granddaddy were, great grandmama, granddaddy were. That's what we saw. So we're just gonna stay angry. Because you think you're gaining your independence in the midst of your anger, but really all you're doing is making sure you don't advance and that you stay right where you are. Because you're chained to the person that hurt you that you haven't forgiven. The detached. The detached. Once burned, twice shot. This person will spend a lifetime protecting themselves from ever being hurt again. These kinds of people are detached. They let no one in. They were social distancing long before social distancing became cool. They uh, won't allow themselves to get close with anybody because they've been hurt so bad. They have decided to take the road less traveled and just walk their own path and don't walk it relationally. Problem is that's not biblical and it's not God's best. Wherever two or three gathered, there he is in the midst. When we work together, a three-stranded cord with God in the middle cannot be broken. Solomon would say, God has called us all to do life together, to walk in agreement, to be in godly relationships. But because of pain and anger and anxiety and hurt, these kinds of people who live under this generational sin struggle, this generational curse, they have chosen to live a very detached life. Then... There are the driven. These are the people who are perfectionists. They're OCD. Everything has to be in order. They're workaholics and they've chosen a workaholic lifestyle to mask the pain of their rejection or their abandonment or whatever they went through. So they've chosen success as an antidote 
to pain. Workaholics, driven. These people try to gain acceptance and affirmation the old fashioned way. Grunt work, hard work, success. If I make more money, maybe they'll love me. If I have more businesses, maybe they'll love me. If I give more money, maybe they'll love me. If I can offer them more, maybe they'll love me. Driven. And then there are the seduced. These are the people who look for love in all the wrong places. While a broken person and a detached person and a seeker lacks intimacy, these people have more than enough intimacy. They look for love everywhere. Short-term, feel-good love. They look for love through physical contact. These folks are often drug abusers. They're overly intimate with way too many people. And they mask their pain with pills and other drugs. They have a legitimate need, but they try to fulfill it in an illegitimate way. This is all a product of the Garden of Eden. This is called a sin struggle. My father and I were hanging out a few days ago and he's actually writing a book he started during COVID. Probably gonna be under a pseudonym name because it's about our jacked up family. And uh, I can't even repeat some of the stuff my great granddads did in this pulpit. And you know, I'll say just about anything, but there's some things I won't say. I mean, they were rough. My father's writing a book about his experience growing up. And he said, my whole family's nuts. And I said, Dad, everybody's family's nuts. Only some of us admit it. Why is that a true statement? Because of our sin struggle. The goal is to get better with every generation to get better and build on something every generation and not ever go back to where it was. To be thankful for the sacrifice that was paid for you to be where you are and leave this earth better than you found it so that your children won't have to struggle the way you did. Your grandchildren will walk on ground you've never walked on before. You can release a blessing into the atmosphere that will change your entire history. You see, we have a movement wanting to go dig up history. I don't think that gets rid of the hurt or the evil of racism by digging up history. I think we build upon history and make this world better and build something better that shines brighter. what God has called us to do. This is what our text says in the New Living Translation. Our ancestors sinned, but they have died, and we, they are mourning because they feel what they are walking in, the poverty, the slavery, the loss of land and goods is because not of what they did, but what their parents' parents did. But they have died, and we are suffering the punishment they deserved. Slaves have now become our masters. There is no one left to rescue us. We hunt for food at the risk of our lives, for violence rules the countryside. The famine has blackened our skin as though baked in an oven. Our enemies rape the women in Jerusalem and the young girls in all the towns of Judah. Our princes are being hanged by their thumbs and our elders are treated with contempt. So they went from a life of entitlement and prosperity to a life of slavery where they're working in the sun to the point they are burned because of the sins of the Father. Jeremiah 14 verse 20, we acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. So they are acknowledging what the fathers did what the generations before them did. They're confessing sins on behalf of what was. You've seen that lately. It's biblical. 
And you have done worse than your fathers, Jeremiah 16, verse 12. For behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me. So let me get to a place where we can identify these curses and this sin struggle. And then we're going to break that curse off of you. And next week, we're going to teach you how to speak a blessing. First, we have to talk about the truth about sin. Let me give you some truth. Number one, sin is inevitable. I do not believe in sinless perfection. I don't believe it's biblical. I believe you are set free. You are filled with the Holy Spirit and you have a comforter that's perfect on the inside of you that can cause you and lead you to make better decisions. I believe you have to turn and repent of your sin and I believe the Holy Spirit has to lead you in your daily lives. But I think it's unbiblical to say that you will never struggle again. Sin is something we always will deal with until Jesus comes back or we get to heaven. It is inevitable. We deal with it. Our children deal with it. You deal with it. Those of you watching online, you deal with it. We all deal with it. It's inevitable. Next, it brings a curse. Daniel 9, verse 5, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. When a generation abandons God in his Bible, there are consequences for the next generation. We're seeing that now. It's inevitable. It brings a curse. It can be passed down. Have you ever watched a family dynamic, an unrepentant family dynamic? You can see the stuff passed down. If you live long enough to see three generations, you will see that the next generation will inherit the qualities of the previous generation and will struggle with what they struggled with unless Jesus gets involved and unless it's broken. It can be passed down. There are consequences for our sins. But the good news is Jesus defeated sin once and for all on the cross. Satan has been defeated. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been guaranteed a victory and we have new life in Jesus Christ. So it's a mindset. We can either choose to live in what was or we can choose to have a better life. We must deal with sin immediately. Sin has to be dealt with. It can't be massaged and fooled around with. It can't be called another name that's cute or cliche. Sin has to be dealt with. If it's not dealt with, it grows. It changes your outside appearance. It changes everything else that you have to do with if it's not dealt with internally. It must be dealt with. I love the story in John 8 when the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus and they set her out, they were fixing to stone her. And I love what Jesus does. We know he starts writing in the ground. I personally believe theologically that he started writing down the men that had slept with this woman because that's how hypocritical religious people are. They'll stone you for what you just got caught doing. They've been involved with it behind the scenes. And I believe Jesus started writing down the names of the woman. And then you know, he said, listen, which one of you is without sin? Cast the first stone. And then they started to leave. But listen to what he says to the woman. He raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So sin had to be dealt with immediately. Yes, there was hypocrisy among the brethren. Yes, there was a religious demonic force at work. Yes, there could have been an evil for evil, tit for tat. But no, Jesus rebuked that demonic spirit, but then he had to deal with her sin. Because just because they were wrong in accusing her, just because they were hypocritical, Jesus didn't say, well, They're wrong, so you just go be wrong. He said, no, I'm going to rebuke them, but then you got to deal with you because you're never going to get better if you don't deal with you. And that's what I want to say as your pastor. You're never going to get better until you deal with you. And I'm never going to get better until I deal with me. We've got to deal with this issue within ourselves. James 5 verse 16 says, confess your trespasses one to another that you may be healed. That's what God has called us to do. Take off our mask 
confess our junk, and live free and fully alive. That's what God has called us to do. So the truth about sin, how about the trickery of Satan? The devil is a liar, a murderer, and a thief. His one job is to deceive your mind, to keep you preoccupied with nonsense and hatred and evil and racism and to keep you invested in things that aren't going to last. Things that perish like silver and gold. Keep you focused on things that don't matter. And here's what Satan will tell you, my friend, about sin. Ah, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Everybody does it. Yeah, that's true. Everybody does it. But a percentage of the people who do it know it's wrong. That's the problem with some forms of liberalism. They want me to change the biblical definition of sin to fit a lifestyle. Now, I don't judge the individual. The Bible says not to. We all sin. We love each other. But in order for me to accept them by their definition, I have to change God's definition of what they're doing. And I'm not going to do it. And that's the trickery of Satan. So we've identified some of these generational sins today. And maybe the Lord's already convicted you. Listen, today I'm not trying to preach you to the point where you feel bad about you. Yes, you need to repent of your sins. You need to ask God to forgive you. Some of you have done that a thousand times and you're saved, but you're still in bondage. Why? Because a curse was spoken over you. Someone said something that wasn't fair. Someone was mean to you. A parent abandoned you. You were abused. You were raped. I don't know what your story is, but we all have one. We all have things that have happened to us that are unfair. And we have to realize that we don't have to be the way mom and dad were, grandmother and grandfather, the people that raised us, the people that left us. God wants to do something new in your family. And if you will call on the name of Jesus today and say, Lord, forgive me. I want a new destiny in you. He will answer you. He will carry you into your destiny. Listen, this is just part one. Next week, I'm going to be coming back to you. And we're going to be talking about this generational sin struggle again because this is a 47-minute message. And I want you to get all the content in this message because I believe you need to realize there's a real devil. There are demons. They have to be rebuked. You've won the victory because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So you do not have to live in defeat. You can live in victory. In the next few weeks, I'm going to tell you how. Choose to walk in victory. I'm Pastor Ronnie. Thank you for connecting with our ministry. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about my friend Ronnie Phillips Jr. and his book, The Hero Within. Everybody has got untapped potential. What is potential? Potential is unrealized reality. There's something in you that you have not discovered yet. There's something in me I have not become yet. And maybe, just maybe, the words of this book will help to draw it out. I believe it'll be something that can radically change your life. The Hero Within. Go get it. I believe you'll really enjoy it. God bless. Pastor Ronnie Phillips delivers help and hope around the world through missions, media, and the message of grace. Go online to RonniePhillips.org to partner with Pastor Ronnie today and join us again next week for another message that will help you live free and fully alive.